Welcome to our live stream for this week. You know, it's been a while, Pam, since we've been here. Pam Case is with me. She's senior producer for The Huckabee Show. We are coming to you live from the theater, the Huckabee Theater, in fact, here in Hendersonville, Tennessee, where we tape our weekly television show that airs on TBN, the Trinity Broadcasting Network. I know you watch it every week. It's how you knew about the live stream. But we're so very excited to uh, have you join us. We've had a little bit of a break because of the 4th of July holiday, so we are trying to get back in the saddle and learn how to ride all over again. Some things we do remember. One is we need you to send questions in the chat because throughout the uh, entire live stream, we're going to be reading your questions. I'll do my best to give some response to them. So uh, be sure to send your questions questions. Send a super chat if you'd like a little more visibility. Move it up to the top. We got moderators watching the chat for your questions. And we always ask you to do this. We still do even after the break. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Leave us a comment, a like, and a share. Gosh, it gets a little complicated here, doesn't it? We got to subscribe, right. notification bell, like, and a share, and all that stuff. Building but our friend group one layer at a time. But a yeah. huge <laughs> group of friends, and we hope a lot of people will be watching. That's one of the reasons we ask you to share it with other people, let them know, hey, they're doing a live stream. You know that guy that has uh, weird things to say about the questions that people ask? Don't miss this, because he's got some strange ones today. Actually, what I've got is some incredibly interesting uh, I would just say fascinating pieces of video. So I don't have to tell you what someone said. I'm going to show it to you. You're going to get to see it. Make your own conclusions. I bet they're going to be very similar to mine. Absolutely. I bet they are. All right, first up, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre knows nothing. That is her mantra. First of all, I think it is uh, important to take a renewed look at Joe Biden's mental state as he continues to, well, let's just say spiral downwards. And then we've got some video of a Berkeley law professor's rather disturbing congressional testimony. Now, one thing we always try to do is to pick up a favorite comment from our previous live stream. Before we get to all those topics, here's our favorite comment from the last live stream. This is from Maria Fernandez, who quotes Ronald Reagan, and I'm quoting him now. I've noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. Maria, wonderful comment of the week. Uh, we congratulate you for sending it to us, that great quote by Ronald Reagan, and very, very true. Now here's the question of the week we have for you. We hope you will respond to us by going uh, right there where it says uh, respond and chat. Here's the question, how is inflation affecting your family. How's inflation affecting your family? Be sure to leave your answers in the chat and in the comments section below. Let's get started. We've got some uh, clips from Corrine Jean-Pierre for the White House press secretary, who seems to be a uh, five foot person in 15 feet of water, if you get my drift. And here's some examples to prove it. First of all, this is Kareen telling us how great the economy is. And when we look at where we are economically, and we are in a strong, uh, we are stronger economically than we have been uh, in history. When you look at the unemployment numbers at 3.6%, uh, when you look at the jobs numbers, uh, more than 8.7 million of, of new jobs created. I want you to just clue in on what she said. We are stronger in our economy than we've ever been in history. I'm just curious, is that the way it feels to you? Because if so, I think you're the only person I've personally had any conversation with who thinks that we have an incredibly strong and wonderful economy. If you're retired, or you one day hope to be, if you've looked at your 401k lately and seen what's happened to it, it's lost an extraordinary amount of value. If you thought you were going to retire at 65, better bump those numbers up a little bit, partner, because you're going to be working a little while longer just to get back to where you were based on this stronger than any time in U.S. history economy. I was stunned that she said that. I thought that was just beyond bizarre. Now, here's another thing she believes that nobody else does. Even the liberal press have a hard time believing this. Her view of how popular Joe Biden is I'd say might be just off kilter 
a tiny bit from reality? Here's her thoughts. What was the president's response to a new poll from the New York Times today showing that 64 percent of Democrats say that they would prefer a different candidate in 2024? And um, I would also say from that very same poll, um, there were 92 percent of uh, Democrats who uh, support this president as well. Look, you know, not to be not get into uh, you know, politics from here or get into a, any political analysis. Um, you know, this is not something, uh, you know, there's going to be many polls. They're going to go up or they're going to go down. Mm, first of all, the actual number is only 70 percent of Democrats. Now, keep, keep in mind, who else they got? Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Adam Schiff, Nancy Pelosi, Hillary. So 70 percent of Democrats support the only president that they can support right now because he's a Democrat. Overall, over 80 percent of the American public, 80 percent, that includes Democrats, Republicans and independents, think the country is going in the wrong direction. So where she comes up with the idea that 92 percent of Democrats support the president, that's not true, but certainly not 92 percent, not even 70 percent of the American people support this president. Um, interestingly, while President Biden was uh, making a trip and headed to the Middle East to beg the Saudis for more oil. She was asked, would he be having a press conference? You know, those things that presidents used to have that Joe Biden had hardly none of. And uh, here was her response. One question, or two questions, but one question on the trip. Does the president plan to hold a press conference after his meetings with the Saudis? Um, right now, I believe, uh, and we'll have more to share, he has that one press conference uh, in Israel. Uh, I don't have anything else to, to share on, on what else will, on, on what are activities of the press conference, other, acti other press conference he may have. Okay. I know nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I, that, that's really the way we look at uh, Karine uh, Jean-Pierre, is somebody who knows nothing, yet she continues to say it, anyway. I think that's the worst. It's just truly unbelievable. All right, let's go to some other uh, clips from the week. This is our president. Joe Biden uh, made a speech last December. Now, you would think as many people as he has on his staff to write speeches, they'd come up with some fresh new material. I want you to listen. These are side-by-side -side clips, a speech he made in December and one that he made today and see if you detect any difference in the words. Here they are. I've, I've used every tool available to address to price, price increases. increases. And, and it's, it's beginning working. to work. Take, gas Take gasoline and gas prices. Last week, I announced the largest ever release from the United States, the United States, States Strategic, Strategic Petroleum, Petroleum, Petroleum Reserve. Reserve. I mean, this is hard even to believe. And, and I mean, this is cut and paste stuff. They put some words down for him. He reads them like Ron Burgundy off the teleprompter. Whatever's in front of him, he reads it. If it's a stage direction, by golly, he reads it like turn head to the left. And he'll say that on the, you know, on the speech. I'm so glad to be here. Turn head to left. Oh, turn my head to the left. Yeah. And in this case, they cut and pasted a speech from last December, stuck it in his prompter. It comes out of his mouth, the same cadence, the same rhythm, the same deadpan delivery there for you to see. I didn't have to tell you what he said. I showed it to you. Now, this week he was in Israel. He comes off the plane. This is something that presidents, and he was a vice president for eight years. He must have done it several hundred times. Comes off the plane. There's a red carpet. Uh, when the public official gets off the plane, there's usually a line of greeters that are there to uh, greet the president. And he walks down that line, shaking hands and making small talk, saying hi. Uh, and they'll introduce themselves, which, by the way, they've always been instructed what to say and not to get in the conversation. I've been in a number of those greeting lines, and you're always told, just say hello. If he wants to engage in a conversation, keep your answers short, but don't you engage the person because they're on a tight schedule. Here's what happens when Joe Biden comes off the plane at Ben Gurion Airport in Israel. He's walked a red carpet many times, but he acts like he has no idea what he's supposed to do. In fact, he even, listen carefully, he asks the question, what am I doing here? Listen. What am I doing now? The 
I'm just, this is embarrassing. They have to show him where the center of the carpet is. And what, what am I doing now? Well, Mr. President, normally you get off the plane, you'd walk down the row of people, you'd greet them, and you'd simply walk down the middle of the carpet. What, what do you mean, what do I do now? Of course that's what you do now. Yeah, fast forward two years. Really? Where are we going to be? Oh, my God. Where will we be? Well, this is Joe Biden talking about inflation last December. And uh, first of all, he, he didn't think, nor did anyone in his administration think there was much to inflation. They used to say it was transitory. But in trying to explain it, I know less about it than I did before he started talking. Here's what I mean. And I think you'll see it change uh, um, sooner than quicker than more rapidly than it will take than most people think. I don't know what that meant. Neither did he. It's just amazing. I'm sure we're getting some questions. Let's go to him. Uh, what you got? I don't even know that I can start after I know. all of that. You know, the uh. good thing is I don't have to give a <laughs> coherent answer. I can just say I'm going to call this one a Joe Biden answer and just talk in circles and all around the world. Okay. Yeah, don't forget everybody watching with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Don't forget to smash the like button and uh, share with your friends. We're still on plenty of time to have discussions with Governor Huckabee today. So we've got a question for you. Jay Luther is asking at what point of the Uvalde debacle um, governor, should Governor Abbott step up or should he just step down? He said he was livid um, when he was hid away. Was he talking about the governor being hit away? That's what it sounds like. I'm going to make sure I understand that. Okay. Then he, then he hit away. Got it. Okay. So he said, or should he just step down? He said he was living. Then he hit away. Hmm. Well, I think what the governor's doing is trying to find out what exactly happened. And the more we know, the more absolutely just gut punching this all gets. I saw a video that was just released this week. This is the video. It shows that 17 officers at the sound of gunfire who were in the hallway, heavily armed, uh, some wearing SWAT gear, others wearing uh, very heavy military type shields or having them. When the gun started, they retreated. I mean, they just took cover and ran away from the gunfire which is remarkable because the number one thing in an active shooting is you go straight as you can to the shooter mm. and try to take him out. Is that dangerous? Yes, it's very dangerous, but it's unmercifully dangerous for unarmed children and teachers sitting in a classroom getting slaughtered by a person who's not even being challenged. One guy, this was the most chilling of all, you see him while the shooting is going on and he goes over and gets some hand sanitizer on his hands and wipes his hands. I'm not sure what he's sanitizing, but I, I just found that so, mm. I, I mean, it was just, how do you do that? Yeah. Gunshots are going off. Kids are in that room screaming, getting killed. And these officers are running away from it. I, 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 they, there's no way they can justify that. Yeah, absolutely they just can't. Not. Um, Governor, a question from L0902G. <laughs> um, please tell us how we can confidently vote in November after the, two, uh, the 2020 election. Well, I think you could confidently vote um, because even though there's always been allegations of uh, election escapades, the one thing that we cannot do is stop voting. Uh, nothing would please and thrill the Democrats more than for Republicans to say, well, we're just not going to go vote. Well, okay, you've just handed it to them. Now they don't even have to fight for it. Uh, it's, it's winning by default. If you're playing football and you think the refs are really kind of cheating for the other side, let me ask you something. Do you just walk off the field? Or do you play harder and try to beat the other team and the refs? So if, if you're of the mindset that you just walk off the field and go to the showers and say, well, we can't win because it, it's not fair, don't play the game. Just get out of the game. But you're going to get what you get, and you're going to hate it when you get it. So my attitude is, no, we play harder. We play better. We beat the odds. We overcome the obstacles that we know are there. We now know what some of them are. Uh, but the last stinking thing we do is sit on our hands and don't vote. That, that's absolutely giving it away to the far left, and we can't do that. 
All right, along these same lines too, and this is a super chat, by the way, from Star Trek Maniac. Big thank you huh. for that. Uh, what are the odds, Governor, of Trump winning in 2024 um, or the GOP odds of taking the House and the Senate back in November? I think the odds of us taking the House and Senate in November are extraordinarily good. Um, first, we don't know if Donald Trump will run in 2024, but if he does, I think he will assuredly be the nominee uh, because most Republicans who are thinking about it will probably defer to him, him having been elected president. And, um, you know, it's hard to say. I think he would win, but what we have to do uh, and I say we collectively, is to remind people that you're not electing him because you like his personality. I understand that his personality offends a bunch of people, but you like him, you vote for him, because that the things he does in the decisions that he makes, the policies that he implements, are the ones that do, truly do make America a much better country. And we all saw the results of that. Energy independence, a secure border, historic breakthroughs in the Middle East, tax cuts that meant wage increases for every American, manufacturing coming back to the states, deregulating businesses, let them focus on uh, manufacturing and making things and paying their employees rather than filling out paperwork for government uh, bureaucracies. Those are some of the things that he got done. Those are important things. Am I willing to put up with some personality quirks to get that? You bet I am, because I'm seeing now what was supposed to be this wonderful, kind personality. And Joe Biden snaps at people all the time. He snaps at a reporter who disagrees with him. He snaps at individual citizens and calls a lion dog face, uh, dog face pony soldier, whatever that's supposed to mean. He's not a nice guy. And he blames everybody in the world but himself for the decisions that he himself made. So this nonsense about, well, he's just a nicer person. I'm not seeing it. I don't see it at all. And I would like to see some policies that make uh, the lives of my family um, much better than the policies that are going on under this current regime. Governor, as you recall, our uh, question for the day is how is inflation affecting your family? And uh, we have had some respond to that. And William Sisk is writing, I make more than what my mom and dad made together and still live paycheck to paycheck. So that's just a simple mm. response to our question of the day. Uh, Shadow 22 asks, Governor, what suggestions do you have for the Democratic Party to level off the radical agenda and return to original party ideals? You know, that's a great question because it points out that there was a time when the Democrats really were uh, honestly good people, had good ideas. They weren't always as good as the ones I think maybe I thought the Republicans had. But I used to say, Republicans aren't right all the time. Re Democrats aren't wrong all the time. I'm not sure I could say that now because I'm not finding a lot that I can say they're right about. Mm -hmm. But it's not because th these are the classic Democrats that I grew up with. These are radical leftists. These are socialists. These are people who really believe that it is okay to take the life of an unborn child right up to the moment of birth and even beyond, that think that uh, defunding the police and letting people out of jail for violent crimes is perfectly acceptable. And not prosecuting people who uh, torch police stations and try to burn police officers while they're in their cars. And that it's okay to call that mostly peaceful protest. So the, the big issue is that the idea of all of us at least believing in free speech and freedom of religion and freedom of press there are a lot of people who identify as the Democrats of today that don't believe that anymore. Now, the tragedy is there are a lot of Democrats who do believe in the old uh, party principles. And what I would say to you is speak up. Quit being silent. Don't sit in the corner. Come out in the middle uh, of the whole arena and shout to the rooftops that you think some of the people who have captured the party have taken it to oblivion. That would be helpful. And speaking of craziness. I want us to go to a portion of a congressional hearing this week held in the U.S. Senate. Uh, a Berkeley University professor, Professor Bridges, was being asked by Senator John Cornyn of Texas about the value of a human baby. Watch. Do you think a, a baby that is delivered alive has value? Yes. Do you think that a, um, 
A, a baby that is not yet born has value? I believe that a person with a capacity for pregnancy has value. They have intelligence. They have agency. They no, have I'm dignity. talking about the baby. And I'm talking about the person with the capacity for and I'm, pregnancy. And you're not answering the question. I'm asking. I'm, you I'm, think answer, that a, I'm answering you, a more interesting you think question that, to you me. Think uh, that's unbelievable. She says, I'm answering the question that I want to respond to. And basically, she did not answer the simple question. First question, do you believe that a baby who makes it into the world, who's born alive, has worth? Long pause. Finally, she says, yes, what else could she say? But then, remarkably, when asked, if the baby is unborn, does it have worth and value? And her answer is blood curdling. She totally avoids it and says that the person giving birth has worth and value. So she answered the question, basically saying, no, the baby has no worth and value. I, I'm just amazed that taxpayers of California pay that professor's salaries. But it wasn't the end of her exchange with senators. Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri asked her whether men could give birth. Watch this exchange. Professor Bridges, you said several times, you've used a phrase, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important Because of my line of questioning? Because so we can't talk about it? Because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist I'm is denying dangerous. that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that there, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think women can <laughs> so get pregnant. So you are denying that trans people exist? Thank and that leads to violence? Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you? Absolutely. Or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no, they're, they're told that to they're question. opening up people to oh, violence we have a good time questioning. in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow, I, I would learn a lot. I've learned a you, lot just I know. in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. Yep. Um, yeah, we've all learned a lot watching that. Again, I want you to re be reminded, taxpayers in California fund that woman's salary and her tenured professorship. If you just ask the question, can men have babies? Suddenly you're a transphobic and you are inviting violence. I don't know where that even comes from. And then she throws out this nutty thing that has nothing to do with the question that one in five transgender people attempt suicide. Maybe they do, that may be a fact. Is it because the senator raises that issue? Or is it because maybe the, the struggle that they've had with tr uh, gender dysphoria has led them to a place of such confusion? And many medical experts are saying, you bet there's an increased suicide among transgender. And it's because all of the stuff that's happening to them is not helping them. Mm. It's making them more confused and in some cases leading them to an extraordinary sense of desperation. Mm -hmm. This is sad, it is sad when you have people who are supposed to be educated, but they're just not real smart. I'm not saying Professor Bridges isn't very well educated. I'll stipulate that. But folks, you can be educated and be really stupid. And when you're educated, but you try to pretend that men can have children, that's educated stupidity. There's nothing smart about that because it just can't be. I was bothered too by the condescending way in which she treated him as well in the, in the line of questioning. Man, I'll tell you, I was angry mm. when I first saw that this week. Woo, got Pam okay. all riled up. Here we go. Luis C. Garcia Jr. Um, asking Governor, what is your take on the January 6th committee bringing criminal charges against President Trump? Well, I think it's 
utterly absurd. The whole thing is a joke. It is an absolute travesty. There is no cross-examination. There is nothing but a very tightly, highly edited uh, script. Then the people who speak, like lovely Liz Cheney, who has joined with Nancy Pelosi, I call her Pelosi's pet Republican, uh, she's reading off a doggone teleprompter. This is not her asking questions. She's just reading. This is a TV show, and it's a lousy one at that. Uh, the fact that they're trying to go after President Trump, look, if you think Trump shouldn't be president, beat him in the election. But don't use the resources of the government to create phony charges, which is what this whole committee has done. I want to point out their big star witness, this uh, young lady, Cassidy Hutchinson, <coughs> and she supposedly has explosive testimony. No, she doesn't. She talked about things she heard but didn't see, all of which was refuted by people who were actually there. Worst of all, if she was so offended by what President Trump did, how come she kept working for him for several months, begged for an ongoing job, called Pam Bondi, the former attorney general of uh, Florida, begging her to please put on the good word with President Trump so she could get a job in his operation down in Florida. You don't want to work for somebody that you just decide is terrible. So all of that is just beyond nonsensical. Um, we cannot get away without showing our Kamala clips of the week. We've got a couple. We'll just roll them. This is Kamala Harris uh, talking about labor and the workforce. And then right after this, um, how that we can't wait for Congress to act. Now, what I want you to do is watch these and tell me, do you think she's prepared to be the leader of the free world? Together, we are expanding access to transportation. Seems like maybe it's a small issue, it's a big issue. You need to get to go and need to be able to get where you need to go to do the work and get home. You need to be able to get to work and get home to do the work, to get to go, to go to get, to get to go, to go to get. And then here it is, she's saying we can't wait for Congress. And so there is a lot at stake. We cannot wait for Congress to act. Congress must act, but also we cannot wait for Congress to act, which is why the President, uh, Joe Biden, this, this morning, earlier today, um, issued executive order. Well, she did at least say to us that Joe Biden is president, because that's something we would not have known had she not revealed that important fact. <laughs> it's hard to watch stuff like that and not laugh, it's but really it's hard. also hard to watch stuff like that and not want to cry. Right. Absolutely. David Anderson is asking today, a governor making a comment here, someone should tell the president that there's no more ice cream. <laughs> maybe then he would realize there's a problem in our country. <laughs> that may be our quote for next week. You know what? <laughs> That's a great observation. I think, you know, if we told uh, Joe Biden there's no more ice cream, inflation has destroyed the ice cream industry, he might decide, I got to quit because I got to have my ice cream cone. I don't have my ice cream cone. He's probably the first president who hears the little uh, tinkling the sound of, of the, the music the, on the, the ice, ice cream, cream truck, truck. <laughs> that runs out of the White House, past the Secret Service <laughs> guard the the day, running. and runs down with his uh, dollar and 50 cents in hand to buy him an ice cream bar. Ah. Crazy. Okay, one more question. All right, Claudia L. is asking, what do you think of the way Newsom made himself at home in the White House while Biden was abroad? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I've never seen an opportunity that's quite like Gavin Newsom. He, he's a piece of work. I think he is setting himself up to run for president, and I think his slogan should simply be, let me do to America what I did to California. And if you'd vote for that, you deserve him. But please, please, do it somewhere else, not in the United States of America. Absolutely. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell, the like button, and the uh, comment button, and the share button. All those things are helpful to us to let people know. Leave your questions in the comments even after the live stream is over. We always would love to have you being a part of the next one. And when you subscribe, you'll know exactly when we're going to be ready to go. Watch the Huckabee Show this weekend. We've got a great show lined up, including Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who's just, I would say, a little on the controversial side. You'll find out why when you watch the show this weekend. You want to know what else we got? I thought you did.
so we'll show you right now. This week on Huckabee, fiery Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. They are after everything that we love about our country. Laughter and inspiration with comedian Dan Culp. David Clark on rising crime. Yael Eckstein on the IFCJ's work with Ukrainian refugees. Bluegrass duo Darren and Brooke Aldridge. Watch Huckabee on Saturday at 8, 7 central and again on Sunday at 9, 8 central right here on TBN.